thanks for tuning in. I'm Pastor Megan, and I hope you enjoy watching with us. Over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And then um, let's go to Acts 2 and verse 40. Acts 2 and verse 40. I'm very excited about this word. I know Holy Spirit wants to minister to hearts. I know that the Lord wants to uh, create a new culture. Say new culture. He wants to create a new culture in, in the house of God. And how many of you know we need a new culture? Amen. Okay. Um, and when I say a new culture, we're talking kingdom culture. Kingdom culture. So Acts chapter 2 and verse 40 says, And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. That's a message in itself. Verse 41 says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God. And having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the Word of God. I thank you that the Word of God is living, it's active, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder and of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to open the eyes of our understanding. I pray, Father, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus to be upon the people this morning. I ask you to give everyone ears to hear what you're saying. I pray for impartation, revelation, and transformation in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. So our subject this morning is doing life together. Doing life together. So going back to this passage of Scripture, there are two major truths that stand out in this passage. The first one is the early church believers were committed to the Apostles' Doctrine. Say Apostles' Doctrine. They were committed to the Apostles' Doctrine. And secondly, they were committed to cultivating relationships with one another. Having a strong, vibrant relationship with God is foundational for success. Very foundational. How many of you know it starts there? If a person is not healthy with God, it's going to affect their relationships with other people. So it's important that our relationship with Jesus is healthy. It's important that you and Jesus are tight. I said you and Jesus got to be like this. Come on, somebody. You don't want to allow anyone or anything to get between you and Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Do not allow anyone or anything to get between you and Jesus. Because if anybody gets between you and Jesus, then your foundation is going to have cracks in it. Your foundation is not going to be stable, and God wants you and I to have a stable foundation. A stable foundation is advantageous to doing life together. So you've got to be rock solid when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. And so it's important to have a strong, vibrant relationship with the Lord. Now, there were many different elements that contributed to the growth of the early church. And one of those elements was fellowship. Say fellowship. fellowship. Now you may say, what is fellowship? Because fellowship is not necessarily a word that we use in our modern culture when we're outside of the church world, out in the marketplace, in the neighborhood, on the job. So it is a biblical term. Fellowship is, the, the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Say koinonia. 
and it means close association. So the apostles, they met from house to house, they broke bread, they were in close association with one another. Community. How many of you know community is important? Communion. Joint participation, partnership. Sharing and unity. This was the New Testament church. They were a unified body. They were speaking the same language. They were traveling down the same road. They had the same vision and they had the same heart. They had the same purpose in life. And so Cornelia is what was happening in the life of the early church. So we see in this passage in Acts chapter 2 that the early church was a close-knit family. They were a close-knit family, and they understood the power of covenant relationship. The power of covenant relationship. Now let's look again in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 44 through 46. It says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, say daily, daily. with one accord in the temple. They were in one accord. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's look at this for a minute. You cannot be in one accord and have two visions. You cannot be in one accord and not be on the same page. They were in one accord. Okay, they were in one accord. we got to find our spot here. Small print. Okay, one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Look at that. They continued daily with one accord. The, if the, you know one of Satan's greatest strategies is to bring division. The enemy knows if I can divide the church, I can render her ineffective. If I can create division and dissension and strife and all of that kind of stuff amongst church members, the enemy knows that he can render the church ineffective. And how many of you know if we're rendered ineffective, then we're not going to be able to do what God has called us to do? So let's look at the word covenant in greater detail. They'll put the screen up or the definition. Noah Webster in his 1828 dic uh, dictionary defines covenant and church affairs. So they'll put that up for you, and I want you to take a picture of that because that is a pretty lengthy uh, definition, but we want to take a look at that. <coughs> Excuse me. They're working on it. So it says, as a solemn agreement, between the members of a church that they will walk together according to the precepts of the gospel. Noah Webster was a born-again believer. And he's talking about covenant in church affairs. It was a solemn agreement. They had an agreement between the members of the church that they would walk according to the precepts of the gospel. So they had something in common. They were born again, children of God, new creation in Christ Jesus, but we're going to walk according to the precepts of the gospel. It reminds me of the early church. They were in one accord. Don't allow the enemy to destroy our one accord. How does he do that? He gets people off into strife and gossip and contention and bitterness and all of that stuff, what that does is it breaks down the unity. It breaks down the one accord. And so if you want to stay in the power of God, then it's important that you stay in the love of God. Because the love of God and the power of God work together. I said the love of God and the power of God work together. Community and working together was a way of life for the early church. Why? Because they were committed to each other's success. There was a commitment to seeing that each individual would succeed. 
I like to put it this way. It was a win-win situation. It's like if Maxine wins, then Aaliyah wins. If Aaliyah wins, then Maxine wins. If Maxine loses, then Aaliyah loses. If Aaliyah loses, then Maxine loses. It's a win-win situation. That requires a covenant mindset. And oftentimes, especially in the culture that we live in right now, many people don't have that covenant mindset. It's about me. It's about my situation. And, and how many of you have seen that in society? And so what that does is it destroys community. I believe that there are people who genuinely want community, but they need God to bring healing to their heart. They, they've got too many knives in their back. They've experienced too much, and they need God to heal their heart. Because if your heart's not healed, your relationships are not going to be whole. Your relationships are not going to be healthy. They'll be surface relationships. They're not going to be healthy relationships. And so the, the, uh, the early church, they made a covenant to act together in harmony, to faithfully continue in apostolic teaching, to fellowship together, to be of one mind and one accord, to eat together and to pray together. That was the New Testament church. They had a revelation of relationship, and I really truly believe that one of the reasons why people are so depressed is because they have no friends. They have no real sense of community. A matter of fact, what Facebook calls friends, they should really change the name friends to acquaintances. You don't have 2,000 friends on Facebook. You have 2,000 acquaintances. So you went to school with the guy, you went to school with the girl, and you guys just befriended each other and like each other's posts, that's superficial. That's superficial. Because you post what you want people to see. But there's no way you can put every waking moment of your life on social media and you shouldn't. Just a little FYI. <coughs> Just a little FYI. There's a thing called privacy. There's a thing called it's nice to be able to have dinner and not have the whole world seeing that we're having dinner. It has its place. Understand me, I'm not criticizing that we use it, but I can't just rely on that and say these are my friends. You need to have some real friends, not social media friends, or they're really acquaintances. It's impossible to have 2,000 friends. You already know it. You don't want 2,000 people knowing all your business now, do you? You probably want to have maybe three or four good close covenant friends that know all your business. <laughs> Am I helping you this morning? And so we have to really redefine what a friend is. Because there's levels of relationships. There's acquaintances, there's friends, and there's covenant relationships. And how many of you know it takes time? It takes time to get to the third level. Everyone starts at the acquaintance level. And that's just being a good Christian. That's just being friendly. That's being kind. I don't have to know you to say hi to you. You know, how many of you talk to folks at the airport? You know, okay, you're, you're friendly. You don't talk to everybody. But you're friendly, though. You understand what I'm saying? There, there, there's a sense of being friendly, being hospitable. That's the word I'm looking for. Hospitality is a requirement. Matter of fact, hospitality is one of the qualities of leadership in the church. Hospitality. Now, that does, hospitality doesn't mean that we're buddy-buddy with everyone, but we're going to be hospitable. And we're going to make people feel important. And we're going to make people feel loved and accepted. This is, the, this is the culture that the New Testament church had. It was a culture of love. Now let's go back to our scripture. Because I realized we didn't finish our scripture there. Um, we, we, we went back to it. Let, hold on a minute. Did I, yes, I did want to go back to that. It says they had all things in common. Let's go to verse 45, Acts 2.45. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now think about that for a minute. Like you just don't do that unless God has transformed your heart. Like that would be like 
everyone in your neighborhood just dividing everything up as anyone had need. That's how it was in the New Testament church. They wanted to make sure that everybody was good. They wanted to make sure that everyone's needs were met. You know, it reminds me of what John tells us. He says, don't just love in word and deed, love and don't just love in word and deed, love in action. So he says, if you see your brother in need and you shut up your bowels of compassion from him, how does the love of God abide in you? And that's what he was saying. How many of you know if a single mom needs groceries, don't offer her a prayer? I'm going to pray for you. Well, she doesn't need you praying for her. She needs you to actually give her some money. Let's just be real. Because money is going to do a lot, go a lot further than a prayer. Oh, are you criticizing prayer? No, it has its place. What I'm saying is, there is a prescription for every situation. If you have a common cold, you don't need anesthesia. Wrong prescription. Okay? Anybody in the medical field knows you are in trouble if you give somebody the wrong prescription for the wrong situation. Prayer has its place. Prayer might work in this situation. Okay, this individual, let's say Max is, you know, he's, his stomach's bothering him. Okay, he needs prayer. I can pray for him. But then you have a single mom over here. She's short $50 at the grocery store. She doesn't need a prayer. She needs 50 bucks. And now she can go on, and that burden's lifted off of her shoulder. And so that's a, that, that is, in essence, what we saw happening in the New Testament church. Now, fellowship and covenant go hand in hand. Fellowship, this word, this, this Greek word koinonia, and covenant go together. They work together. Because really, in order to have, a, in order to have a fellowship, covenant has got to be threaded in there. There's got to be a thread of covenant. Now, we know what covenant is, right? Covenant is a binding agreement between two people. Covenant empowers fellowship, and without, fellow, and without covenant, there can be no lasting fellowship. Covenant empowers fellowship, and without covenant, there's not going to be lasting fellowship. Because if there's no covenant, then it's, it's like standing on sand. It's like building your house on sand. No foundation. How many of you know what's going to happen when the storms come? It's going to f fall out. Covenant is that foundation. Agape love is that foundation. That's what we build upon. That's what the New Testament church built upon. And that's why they were healthy in the area of covenant. And so it takes two or more people to come together and agree upon a thing in order for there to be covenant relationship and partnership. Partnership is part of koinonia. It's part of fellowship. And what the Lord is saying is he's like, I want my people to begin to partner with each other. I want partnership in the house of God. I want partnership in the Christian community. Partnership. Partnership. The Bible says two are better than one. We'll get over there in a little bit. But two are better than one. Partnership. You can do more when you're partnering with somebody versus when you're working by yourself. And so God wants to bring healing to hearts. And I said that last Sunday, and I believe it. And I know that that's what the Lord wants to do today is he wants to heal hearts as he did in our first service. And so a lack of covenant is the reason why many relationships, though, we see are falling apart and failing. We see that all over the world. We see that in the church world. We see that in the secular world. A lack of covenant is why many marriages split apart. Broken covenant. The covenant's been breached. We see that in relationships where maybe somebody was really tight. Maybe they were best friends and something happened. Uh, maybe a secret was disclosed. What does the Bible tell us in the book of Proverbs about a talebearer? Let's say you got a best friend and you're sharing things with that friend in confidence and then that friend goes and shares that with somebody else. There's been a breach in the covenant. Now that person feels like they can't trust them. I had that happen to me years ago. See, the thing, the Bible says your sins will find you out. So I had somebody, and I was just talking to him, you know, just building relationship, and 
Lo and behold, this individual's family member had told me that he had been running his mouth. I'm like, what? I says, why would he be like talking about stuff that he shouldn't be talking about? And so it created distrust in my heart towards this individual. Because I learned from my pastor a long time ago, he says it's called privileged information. So certain conversations have to happen, but they only happen in certain rooms. Because it's in a room of people who are mature enough to handle whatever the issue is. Come on, somebody. There's a reason why some stuff that happens in, in government, you'll, you and I will never know about it because it doesn't concern us. And most people couldn't handle it if they really knew what was going on. So that's why they don't tell people what's going on. It's not, it's not, about, it's not about being secretive. It's called protecting people. People, one thing I've learned over the years is people can only handle so much. You don't tell people what they can't handle. So the more you grow and the more you mature and the stronger you get in the Lord and you begin to develop certain characteristics, then you can handle more. Some people, you tell them something, they're about to lose their salvation. It's like, welcome to the real world. Welcome to what's really happening in society, in the church world and in the secular world. And people just, they're just, oh, my goodness. And I, I, think, I believe one of the reasons why people freak out is because their hope and their trust is in this world system. And when your hope and your trust is in God, nothing surprises you. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> and so those of you who work at Battelle or you work at a Hanford, you know what I'm talking about. There are certain things you can't even go home and tell your spouse unless you want to lose your job and be thrown in prison. It's confidential. So Proverbs tells us about that. When you have a talebearer going around doing this, talking about things that they shouldn't be talking about, that, that tears down. That's the quickest way to tear a relationship up. The quickest way to tear up a relationship is to be, is to be a talebearer. Come on, somebody. How many of you have been? <laughs> this right here? <laughs> and how many of you know news spreads fast? I believe, it's, I believe it moves at the speed of light. <laughs> Depending on who's talking. <laughs> They're like, whoa, it hasn't even been 24 hours and 5,000 people know about this already. Oh, you know, I'm just having fun, but you understand what I'm saying. And so it, covenant, as I said, is essential. And what God wants when I talk about doing life together is I, well, I believe what the Holy Spirit wants is he wants us to go beyond just having shallow relationships. There are different levels that you're at with different people. And that's okay. And another myth that I want to destroy, because again, it's insecurity when people talk about cliques. I understand that there's cliques, but let's flip around the coin. You're not going to connect with everybody. So is that a click? So people who are always talking about clicks, honestly, they're insecure. Because just the way that relationships work, you can't connect with everybody. It's just not humanly possible. You can be friendly, and we should be, and we ought to be friendly with each other. But there are certain people that you click with, and there are certain people you don't click with, let's say, for being buddy-buddy. But whether you click or don't click, how many of you know we can be friendly? It's called hospitality. But I want to destroy that myth of, oh, they're just a bunch of clicks, and I don't, I don't like that church because they got all these clicks. And Well, I mean, everybody connects with people. Birds of the feathers flock together. People typically, people who play sports, they're going to gravitate towards people who play sports. How many of y'all remember your high school days? Okay, let's talk about all the different groups in school. Help me out this morning. What do we got? You got the wrestling crew? Did I say that? Music? Volleyball? You got the jocks? You got the cowboys? I mean, you got all the, no, dude, seriously, you got all the different groups in school. So let me ask you a question. We're just being honest in church. Is there something wrong with that? Or are those people just connecting with each other because they have something in common? 
Because everybody can connect with somebody. And that's the point. So people who say, I can't connect with anybody, please. There are 7 billion people on this planet, and you can't connect with one person? I, I want you to just stop and think how that's not even logic, just thinking like that. Don't tell me out of thousands of people you can't connect with one person. It's easy to point the finger and say it's always other people. It's always other people. I can't connect with nobody. I can't connect with nobody. These people are this way. These people are that way. I'm on to something this morning because I wasn't doing this in first service. But why is it always other people? Maybe there's something in you that keeps you from connecting with other people. And it's just a fact. I mean, people run in certain, I mean, doctors, they probably got, you know, guys that they, you know, they do things together. They have something in common. Scientists, they have something in common. I'm not saying you can't have friends outside of your circle. But typically, most people are going to connect in the world that they're in. Look at people in Hollywood. Most of their friends are what? They're all in Hollywood. Is that a click? It's a tribe. It's a tribe. We're having fun in church. <laughs> it's all right. <clears throat> no, it's a tribe. Everybody has their tribe. Does that make sense? So when people come into, but this, but this is what you don't want. Now we want to bring balance. When people walk into the door, no matter what your tribe is, you want everybody to feel at home. That's, that's community. That's community. But I don't believe in forcing relationship either. I don't believe that, okay, because you just certain people, they're just not into certain things. So I'm not going to try to make you go to the knitting club. <laughs> and that's a real old example. So it's like, <laughs> or, you know, Make you be a part of, a, I'm trying to think of in high school, you got like the DECA group. You got all these different clubs. And again, people who have certain interests, they're going to go to those clubs. So as a church, we all have one thing in common. But even in having the one thing in common, there are people who got diversities of gifts. So even when it comes to our home groups, there's going to be certain individuals that maybe they gravitate towards Alexis and they gravitate towards kind of what she's got going over there. Then you have someone else, okay, they're going to gravitate towards Cameron. That's not a click because it's not possible for Alexis to have uh, 200 women in her connect group. It's not possible for Cameron to have 200 men in his connect group. So you're going to have to have many different groups and there's going to be a dynamic about each group. That's not a click. I want to get on that. That's not a click. It's just called that God is the one who sets each member in the body as he sees fit. So there's something that Alexis has that the ladies who go to her group, they need what she has. Then you come over here and let's say, you know, you've got, uh, Cameron's got a group of, of guys. There's something that's on Cameron that people who come to him, they need what he has. And that's what makes the body of Christ amazing. So throughout the week, okay, people meet in their home groups. Then we come together as a corporate family on Sunday. And regardless of your tribe, regardless of who your home group leader is, regardless of whatever, guess what? We're just loving on each other, saying hi. Now, now we're being hospitable. This is where people get off into clicks. You come into a setting like this, and we all have been there before, even, even anywhere, whether it's on the job, whether it's at school, whether it's in church, and people have this attitude, you're not part of my tribe, so I can't even say hi to you. Or I'm not going to hug you because we're not part of the... See, now that's not healthy. And how, how many of you know... <laughs> I, I heard a brother was sharing something with us last week. He says he's walked into churches and the worship would stop. I'm like, huh, really? That's, that's a cliquish mentality. New person walks in, we shouldn't be like. <laughs> How would you feel if you walked into a place for the first time and they were like, it's almost like this look of, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Byron? 
<laughs> what are you doing here, Andre? <laughs> it's like, do you see what I'm saying? You never want, we don't want people to feel like that. I'm just pastor just talking to the family this morning. We don't want people to feel like that. So say balance. Everyone has people that they connect with. We all have the interest. Guys that like to hunt, they're going to go and they're going to do more things together than those who don't want to hunt. But hospitality is a quality that we all need to have. It doesn't matter if I'm not into hunting, but I can hug guys and talk to guys that hunt. Because we have other things in common, even though we may not be out shooting deer with them. <laughs> Amen. At least the guys that do know how to hunt, they could survive should we have something catastrophic. So uh, it's kind of good to be friends with Matt Saul and Andre Chavez. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Uh, and some, and, and, I mean, and some of us, you don't want to gut an animal. Some people, it doesn't bother them. They'll just, whatever. Other people, ooh, nasty, but they're like, this is dinner. <laughs> so, and when you feel don't eat, then that's what you got to do. <laughs> I remember when we went to Mexico and we were in the market. And they had the animals just hanging down. They were skinned. So I'm just walking along. And at the time, our missionary, Don Sims, he was just, he was a joke. He was hilarious. I mean, a joke in a good way. Just a, just a funny man. So he came up behind me and just, just, I mean, he just scared me. He did something. I just, I just started jumping and, and freaked out. Look at this. I think it was a, a cow hanging down him. Like, wow. I mean, it, it, was, it was hilarious. <laughs> so anyways, John 13, 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So you notice, and I, I've talked about this in the past whenever we've done a series on love, but I want to really emphasize something here. You notice if you go to Matthew, you don't have to go there, but just make a mental note of that. Matthew chapter uh, believe it's uh, 12, uh, 37 through 40. He says, uh, I want you to love one another as I have, excuse me, he says, I want you to love others just as you love yourself. Jesus, in this passage, raises the bar. He's like, I want you to love others with the same love that I love you with. So agape love is advantageous to partnership. We cannot partner with one another without the love of God being the foundation. And, and really, I, I mentioned to you earlier that people have a tendency to isolate because they've been hurt. And the body of Christ has been known to be the only army that kills its wounded. And my confession is that Sozo Church, we're not going to be known as an army that kills its wounded. Because when people are wounded, they don't need to be killed. They need to be healed. They need to be healed. And the Lord dropped something in my spirit the other day. Mercy, everybody deserves mercy. However, mercy can only be experienced where there's repentance. So I can't extend mercy towards a person if they won't repent. God doesn't extend mercy towards people who won't repent, now does he? Hell is filled with people who God doesn't want them there, but they chose to go there because they would not, you know, accept him. They would not believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. And so I believe that when a person is in a place of repentance, I don't care how hard they have fallen, they can be restored. They can, mercy can be extended to them. But again, the key word is repentance. I don't want to stay along on that because that's another message in itself. But some people who say they've, been, they've repented, there's no real repentance. It's just, I'm sorry, um, whatever. But there's no repentance. And if there's no repentance, there's no mercy. And if there's no mercy, in that case, there's really no anointing. Now they're just operating out of their gift. Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, but there's no anointing on that vessel. Unless there's been brokenness of repentance. I'm even though King David is an example of brokenness and repentance. 
That man fell, and he fell hard, but he repented. And the Bible says, God tells us that, <coughs> excuse me, God tells us that he was a man after my own heart. A man who committed adultery and murdered the woman's husband. God says he was a man after my own heart. Now, it's either God knows something that we need to know or he's on something. Because in our religious mind, we would think that the person who's never done anything wrong, they've been this perfect saint, that person is the person after God's own heart. And God's like, no. Pharisees aren't after my heart. Sadducees are not after my heart. Scribes are not after my heart. David was a man after my own heart. Why? Because David was broken. There was repentance. Repentance. Very good. Repentance. And that's why he experienced mercy. Is this helping everybody? And so agape love is a covenant word. Say covenant. It is a covenant word. Now, let's look at Proverbs 18.1. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desires. He rages against all wise judgment. A man who isolates himself. There is a difference between isolation and solitude. We all need solitude. If you don't have solitude, you're, you're not going to be, you're going to find yourself under a lot of stress. We all have to have a place of solitude. And it's not just doing things spiritual. It's also doing things in the natural that relieve stress. How many of you know prayer, the word, fasting, praying in the spirit? Those things are good. We need to be doing that. That's foundational. But some of you, maybe you work off to burn off steam. Maybe you do other things to burn off steam. Now, when I say other things, I'm talking about things that are legal. <laughs> Let's clarify that. Legal. But isolation is not good. Jesus withdrew himself, not to isolate himself from the people, but to go and be with his father and to fill up. He had to replenish his energy. He had been out ministering to the people, so it was important for him to go and spend time in the presence of God. You need solitude. You need solitude for your mental sanity. You need solitude. And some of you don't have enough solitude. So you've got to talk to the Holy Ghost and you've got to figure out how to get solitude. That's that time with Jesus where you're talking to him and he's talking to you. But isolation is a whole nother level. That's not safe. That's when people begin to withdraw and they start separating themselves from other people. They're, they don't go to church like they used to anymore and they're just trying to tough it out. I'm going to just do this on my own. But on the inside, they're dying. On the inside, they're drying up because they've isolated themselves. And oftentimes, people isolate themselves due to past hurts due to betrayal and abuse and divorce and so forth and so on. All those different things cause a person to want to withdraw and isolate themselves. Isolation destroys fellowship, and it cuts a person off from receiving from the benefits of community. Isolation destroys fellowship. If you're in isolation, there's no partnership. There's no fellowship. Nobody can get to you. I mean, not everybody that wants to get to you wants to hurt you. God is trying to send people to you to help you, but if you're like this, you can't even receive help. I don't want to get hurt anymore. I, I got to keep everybody away because I'm tired of getting hurt. The Bible tells us over in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, it says two are better than one. He talks about if a person falls down and he's alone, that's not a good thing. Imagine being up in the Cascade Mountains by yourself hiking and you fall. You're by yourself. You have no cell phone coverage. How would that be? You might not get out of there alive. You have no gun on you either. It's just you and your hiking shoes. And you got bears. You got mountain lions. You got all kinds of things up there, but you fell down and you broke your leg. How do you get out of the mountains? How do you get out of there? 
I saw a documentary, I believe we watched that somewhere in South America, but it was two guys. See, that was the thing where the guy did break. I think he broke his leg. They were climbing some mountain or whatever, and he had to drag himself. I mean, it's a miracle. All the way, I don't know, it probably took him days, but he finally got back down to camp, just going over rocks and everything. Fell into a crevasse, got out of that. But had he been by himself, he wouldn't have survived. Because somebody's got to pull you out of that. Two are better than one. That's the point I'm trying to say. So we can do life by ourselves, or we can do life with somebody else. We can do life in partnership. And so I've had plenty of opportunities, like, like many of you, I've had plenty of opportunities to get bitter and angry and resentful and unforgiving and just like, you know what, I'm tired of getting hurt. I'm just not going to fool with folks. Who's been there before? Come on, just wave at me. We all have been there. But then I've had to decide, you know what, not everybody's like that. This is, what, this is one thing that we have to overcome when we're dealing with hurt is not to be stereotypical. Oftentimes, people get hurt, and they throw the baby out with the bathwater. I've seen it over and over again. I've had to overcome the same temptation. You, get, you, get, you run into a bad police officer, now all cops are bad. That's not true. That's, that's very stereotypical. You have a bad experience at a church, so now all preachers are... It's like, no, not all preachers are crooks. Not all preachers are, there's a, there are more God-fearing men and women of God out there than we realize. There's, what we do and what society does and what the media does is we magnify the few bad apples. See how the enemy is? He always focuses on negativity. And the negativity oftentimes overshadows the good works and the positive stuff that's going on in society. So you got a few cops who get off and do something. What about the thousands and thousands and thousands of law enforcement officers that love what they do and they're here to serve and protect? What about that? So we have to be careful not to be stereotypical. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Look at your neighbor and say, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So in order to come out of isolation... A person must recognize that we are better together. We are better together. Now, I know from personal experience the power of a connect group. I mean, I led a connect group for years, but I was also part of a men's Bible study back in 97, 98, somewhere around there. And I went faithfully to the Monday night men's meeting. And it was during that season that I really began to grow and flourish into a man of God. It was during that season that I learned how to be a man of God. Why? Because I surrounded myself with other men of God. I wanted to get into an environment where I could grow. I did not want to do life by myself. And so obviously with my story, especially coming up without a male figure in the house, I wanted to get around some other male figures. I wanted to, I, want, I had just stepped into the ministry, but I still felt like, man, I, I, there's a lot of growing that I need to do, and so I need to get around some people that can help me. And I'm telling you, that Monday night men's meeting was a tremendous asset to my life. Going to the Promise Keepers event, I remember that at the Kingdom, and some of the other things that some of you remember that, and some of us have been around for a while. And so uh, it was a powerful, powerful time. But see, had I isolated myself, I, wouldn't have, I would not have experienced that. That's why we do things for men. That's why we do things for women. That's why we have home groups, not because we're trying to create more, but we're trying to create community. That's what God wants. And here's a, here's a choice everybody's got to make. You can either be in community with the world or you can be in community with your believers, with other believers. See, Jesus is a friend of sinners. We are to be a friend of sinners, but when you need to vent and you need to talk to somebody, you don't typically should be going to people who don't have, know anything about God. How are they going to help you? They're going to tell you, just go to Jackson's, man. Just drink it all. Here's some weed. You know, here's this, here's that. The world has their way of dealing with stress. And so uh, you don't want to go down that road. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, just about done, she says, the more we are involved in a social group, the less our risk of death is from all causes. 
while relationships of any kind have been shown to improve our chances of survival by up to 50%. My wife sent that to me this morning. I'm like, that's powerful. So when you're involved in community, your chances of survival is up to 50%. Look at somebody and say, it's time to do life together. <laughs> Let's go to this last scripture, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. We're going to read this scripture, and then we're going to pray, and then I'll let you go. Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. We all have been there. How many of you have had a complaint against somebody before? Everybody else is lying in the house of God, Roy. <coughs> I've had complaints against people. How many of you have had a complaint against your spouse before? Just see that people don't want to be honest about that one, huh? Everybody has. How many of you have had a complaint against your children? We're all in the same boat. It's not that we don't have complaints. How do we handle our complaints? Because there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. There's no such thing as a perfect house. Issues come to all of us. How do we handle our issues? How do we handle stuff? Oftentimes, to be honest with you, people in the church are no different than people in the world. They handle the stuff the same way. Cussing, screaming, fighting, belittling. And God's not in that. He's not in it. And it actually grieves the Holy Spirit. If you look at it in context, when we say grieve not the Spirit, it's all in the context of us walking in love and treating each other with respect. And so I love this, though, in Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14. He says, above all, put on he says, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. It is the bond of perfection. Listen, agape love binds our hearts together. It knits us together. Listen to this. We're just about done here. I didn't get to this in first service, but this is critical. This Greek word bond means that which binds together. It's a band, a bond. It also refers to ligaments by which the members of the human body are united together, that which is bound together. So think about your health class. When you look, if you can imagine a, 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 a human body with muscles and how everything is just knit together, that's what the love of God does for you and I. It knits our hearts together. Agape love binds us together just like ligaments keeps our muscles and bones all intact. Wow. Are y'all hearing me this morning? It holds us together. Love holds us together. Love is foundational. Agape love is foundational. It is the main ingredient to partnering together. It's the main ingredient to doing life together. When we are in agape love, when there's that thread, guess what it does? It, it, there's nothing that can get between there. JP and, and Nancy, come up here. I'm going to give you an example. Come on up on the stage. Give them a hand. <coughs> All right. So let's, uh, yeah, we'll be fine. So stand right here. Hold, hold, your, hold hands. And, and grip as tight as you can. So we're talking about a bond. Think about this. So let's say someone's coming. We're just going to, I'm going to pretend to be circumstances. I'm life circumstances. So here I am. I'm coming, and I'm trying to destroy this bond. Don't let me pull your hands apart. <laughs> I'm trying to destroy this bond. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. This is what happens oftentimes in marriage in relationships, in church life, there's things that come against us. Just life, circumstances, disagreements, misunderstandings, and what's happening? The enemy's trying to destroy that bond. 
But you notice I can't pull their hands apart? Because this represents agape love. Going back to that Greek word bond in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14, when agape love binds you together, there's nothing that can separate that. It's not the circumstances don't come. It's not that we don't go through hardships. It's not that storms don't come to us. But it's, now imagine if agape wasn't there. Then it would be like this, where the first thing, boom. That's what we see oftentimes is the separation because it's not agape love. It, it's not agape love that's holding them together. It's the other types of love, which is conditional love. Come on, somebody. Let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, guys. So it's, it's the love of God that binds us together. It's that love, it's that thread that God wants to develop in this church, in our culture, right here at Sozo Church. He wants to develop that strong bond. So I'm going to ask you to stand right now. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you were so blessed. Um, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on social media or even look us up on our website. See you next time.